So if you will bow your heads with me, dear God, we come to you now at the appointed time. We just ask that you just speak directly to us, dear Lord, and allow us to receive it in the way that you, you uh, need us to, and allow us to go out and live it, and we can become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray, amen. I'm going to uh, end the turn, Turning the Page um, sermon series this week in um, kind of a odd title for this sermon because uh, um, kind of like not turning the page. So it's turning the page um, in turning the page for, to courage, turning the page to um, consistency, and uh, turning the page to, to serve. All right. So um, how many of you have had this conversation with yourself, like I need, I need to like uh, get my stuff together. I need to get more organized. I need to do this and that. But before I do that, I just need to get past that next project or that next date. Or when you say like, uh, oh, I need to lose weight. But when I get back from vacation, I'll hit it pretty hard. Um, or you know, um, when the new year comes, everybody, you know, everybody's going to lose weight, and then by January the 3rd, you're caught eating cupcakes, you know, out in the alley. All right, but we, uh, we have these uh, ideas in our head, and uh, we get these uh, limitations put on ourselves, and uh, really, the, really the idea sometimes um, is just trivial, and it's just pure, in my situation, a lot of it's just pure laziness. Um, I, have, uh, I have just a I don't know, maybe one, maybe a half a talent, one talent of something. Um, but I've got a lot of faults. And one of my faults is I, I can be a, a procrastinator. Okay, Arian, that wasn't Arian's voice, though. In fact, um, like my dad said, I was going to join the procrastinators of the USA, and I just never got around to filling out that application. <laughs> All right, and then they never really ever met. <laughs> Lucretia, it's good to have you back. I missed your laugh at my jokes. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, you know, and a lot of that stuff is trivial, and a lot of it, you know, is not monumental, not, you know, such a deal to our lives. You know, a few extra pounds here and there, and you got rooms in your house that are, that need cleaned out and that kind of stuff. All right, but here's, but here's, where I kind of want to center today is that sometimes, sometimes we know we need to make changes in our lives. Sometimes we know that we need to double down on some stuff. Sometimes we know that we need to like uh, um, get some things straight and we constantly push it off to the next, you know, timeline. Like, well, I really, I really need to pray but, um, you know, I'm going to start mon next Monday morning. I'm going to work out. I'm going to wake up early, set the alarm. I'm going to get up, have my quiet time, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to do it. And then what do you do Monday morning? Hit the snooze like four times, and then it's passed, all right? And then um, and a lot of it's just because we're not in habit of it. It's not habitual. But, um, and we have bad habits that keep us from changing, and they become lifestyles. But um, there's, also, uh, there's also some things where we feel like that we are being pushed in a direction to serve. We're being pushed in a direction to do some things. And uh, there are some things that could keep us from doing that, either fear or, you know, we talk ourselves out of it. Um, I, ha I had a famous, or not a famous, but a, a constant conversation in my head at my previous church. And what... I would do is when I would feel the, the push to do some stuff, I always had a ready excuse to God that said, we don't have enough resources for that. We don't have enough room for that. And then one day it hit me as I was driving down the road is that you have the exact amount of resources that you need because you're not pushing the limit to anything. Understand? So God was pushing me in a way and maybe we had to develop some new things and maybe go outside our comfort zone, but I was containing it because of the limitations in my head, all right? And if you read the story of Lazarus, 
in, a, in just a, an amazing story in the book of the Bible, the book of John, is, uh, you know, um, constantly every person in that story is putting limits on Jesus Christ. You know, you're four days late. We thought you loved him. If you had been here, why would you not be here? Yes, I know I'll see him in, you know, in the resurrection at the end. I'll see him in heaven, you know. Oh, and then, you know, he's been dead four days. Uh, you know, he stinks by now, surely. And then at the end of that story, the only person who has to limit Jesus Christ is himself when he has to say the name Lazarus come forth or else he'll bring every dead person up out of the ground. Okay, so we put limits on things that can happen in our lives and we push them off. But the truth of the matter is with God, there is no limits. And uh, we are the ones who put limits. We constantly say like, hey, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get through the epidemic or we'll get, you know, we'll get through the summer, get to August. And, and I understand that, all right? And there is the opportunity to plan and there's things that do limit you. But what I want you to think about today is I want you to get down to the root of the problems in your life where you are pushing things off. You're pushing off spiritual maturity, spiritual progress in your life because you are either scared, um, and you know me, I'm just going to shoot you straight, okay? You're either scared, um, you're either too comfortable, um, lazy, selfish, or whatever the, the reason is. And those are words that I would use on myself, okay? So th that's what we're talking about here, is that um, when, when you're called to do something by God, He's calling you to do it, and He's not going to be interested in our limitations. He's not interested in our timelines, okay? He wants you to do what you're called to do. And in fact, there's a famous saying, and I... I you know, I say it all the time, and it's bloom where you are planted. And we can always come up with excuses about, you know, well, the rail's too small, or our resources are not there, or, you know, the volunteer base isn't there, or we can do that, we can't do that, all right? And, and, but in your personal life, you need to understand that if you're called, and you're called by God to do something, then he's asking you to bloom and he doesn't really care and he's not limited by all of these excuses or all these circumstances that we can throw at him and say well I can't do it because of this or I can't do it because of that and this isn't a good time and I'll push it off and that's where we get into trouble and that is where we stop serving and that is where our our spiritual health starts to decline our prayer life gets stale, and then we don't see the blessings in our lives, our families, our churches the way that we need to, it's because we're not serving in the manner, capacity, in the way that God has called us to serve. So in 1 Corinthians 7, and it's, and it's kind of funny that this is uh, in that section because that, that chapter is mostly about the secrets of marriage. So, um, you know, if you apply that to, to the marriage situation is, uh, you know, we got a lot of people who are pushing things off in marriage, you know, looking outside of marriage and all that stuff. So this is basically saying that bloom where you're planted, okay? And inside of these verses, there are three promises of contentment. And now listen, there's a difference between happiness, sadness, and contentment. All right? Happiness is like, a, it's like a brief moment where you're happy and you have the, the emotional reaction, um, you know, and you, and you almost have the butterflies and, and you get in like a, like a high um, from all the whatever's flowing through your body. And then sadness is where you're down and you can't see any positives and, and you know, you're brokenhearted or whatever. Contentment is a different kind of deal. And contentment is where you are comfortable and you are thankful and you are living a life to where you're not sad, you're not constantly overjoyed. It's just a comfortable life of peace and of tranquility. And it's a life that Jesus promises, but so many of us miss it. And there's three promises of contentment that, is, that, that are found in these verses, all right? 
So here's the basic, here's the basic um, concept of what we're going to talk about today. Number one is that you have to serve. We've all been asked to serve. We've all been given the mandate to serve, and we all have been given a ministry to serve in. You have it, I have it. Some of us just have a more public role. Some of you have a private role. But in all reality, sometimes, if not all the time, the private roles that you're called to serve in are a lot more impactful than when I get up here and and flap my gums for 65 minutes, 75. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Making sure you're awake. Okay. But these private roles, you know, this, this, and, and I say private it's, it's not the ones where, you know, you're just spotlighted. And the, I mean, we have, uh, and, and she's not here, and she's someone we need to pray for, but like Fonda Clore, you know how many times she's taken people to the doctor, to the, ner- or to the um, grocery store, and never tells a soul, never does, and just constantly does stuff like that. And, you know, she's, she's made an impact on people. And, um, you know, Jan talked about all the people that were willing to help her and, and take her to different, you know, to... Um, different appointments and stuff, and, um, you know, I hear about food that is being brought to people in times of need and everything. It's just, that, that kind of stuff really makes an impact on people, because they expect me to get up and preach. That's expected. And here's the other thing. When I show up at the hospital or at, you know, that's expected of me. If I don't do it, I, you know, I get a frowny face, or I, you know, I, I get negative, menos puntos, as it was in Spanish class, right? I say that right? Okay, so they expect me to show up, all right? But what really, but, but what really you know, blesses people and what really brings um, you know, the feeling of unity and a Christianity and fellowship is when I get there and they say, hey, Richard and Mary Beth just left like 30 minutes ago. You know? And I'm like, hey, that's wonderful. Okay? Or like some of you guys have been there and they stopped by or they called or they sent over some food. That's the stuff that makes a difference, okay? So... You're being asked to serve, and here's, here's the deal. The Bible says, and we're in, I'm going to go to the, to the scripture now. Move this way. All right. Good? Turn right. Oh. Sorry, wrong place. All right. But as God has distributed to each one, there it is. Each one of us has received our ministry, received our talent, all right? As the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. There is the first promise of contentment, and there it is, is that God has called you, and now you have to understand, okay? You have to understand who's calling you, and this is a God who will promise you peace. This is a God who promised you that his love can never be separated from you. This is a God who's promised you strength. This is a God who's promised you everlasting life. So this is a God full of promise, and he's asking you, he's putting it on you, that here is how I want you to serve, and so when you accept this calling, if you do it the way that I'm asking you to to do it, you will receive contentment if you walk in the footpaths that I have prepared for you. So the first one is that we are all being called and you have to serve where you are when you're called, all right? And with that comes the promise of contentment. And so I ordain in all the churches. So this is not just one specific church or that church gets more. It's for every Christian that we are called to serve. And what I want you to just concentrate on right now is that you need to serve where God calls you, bloom where you are planted. Okay, so let's get into that a little bit. So this is what he asks. And he and it's a very it's a very very crude example. All right, it's very crude language, but it goes back to the to the history of uh, you know the sign of Abraham and circumcision and all that stuff. So this is what he says. All right, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. And was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. All right? So here's what what is going on, is that God is calling you, and when he calls you, he calls you when he finds you. 
So you cannot tell God, I can't go to church until I get a little bit better. Have you ever invited someone to church? And they say, well, I've been wanting to come out, but I got to get some stuff together. I got to clean my act up a little bit before I walk out to church. That's more of a statement on the church than it is on that person because people need to be running through that door. This should be a hospital for the sick where we are the service, and we are the nurses and the doctors and, and, the, and the, um, the CNAs who help people and help cert, you know, treat them and help lead them to good spiritual health and help you know, keep that proactive. And so you can't tell God that I need to do some things, I need to improve some things. God is calling you, and when he calls you, he calls you when he finds you. All right, so you don't have to do any other thing, all right? Just accept the calling. And then it says, uh, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. So basically is what it's saying is that all the stuff that we get so tied up about and we get so torn up and we judge each other on and all that stuff, he's saying kind of push that aside right now, all right? And because keeping the commandments of God is what matters, And so the commandments of God are this. I have called you to serve in this kind of way. I need you to go out and do it and walk this certain way, okay? I need you to be able to forgive people. I need you to always be loving. I need you to be someone who is a moral example. I need you not to be a stumbling block to your brothers. I need you to be someone who loves your wife and loves it in such a way that you become one and that you are showing and you're um, creating a, a house of love and of nurturing. You need to raise your kids in the right kind of way. You need to be a, an employee you know, who is on time and honest and loving and caring and not backbiting and not tearing people up and all that stuff. Those, these are the commandments of love. Okay, Love God with all your heart, with all your soul. That is the first and the, and the most commandment. And then this is the second, and it is love your brother as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself, all right? So that's what we're built on. And that is what the underlying, the underlying concepts that we're taking with us when we serve. And when we get called to serve, we don't turn to God and say, well, I just need to work on some of those commands, you know, I need to get better at this. It's time to serve, all right? But each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. And here is the other thing is that we need to have some consistency in our lives. And what can, be, what can be troubling and what can be detrimental to our health, our spiritual health, is that we get too spread out and we get too, um, you know, we change and we do this. And, we, and I need, we need people to have a very direct conversation with God and nail down what it is they're being called to do and then go do that fervently. And when God adds other things onto you, then you need to accept that, work it in, let him allow you to work it in, and then do it fervently as well. All right? But this thing where we are worried about how am I going to be perceived, you know, I messed up back in 1991, you know, all this stuff, nothing matters except that you display the love of God. And when you serve, you do it lovingly. And you do it with the right motives. And everything that we do here is to glorify Jesus Christ. And in your serving, you, you have to do it for the right reasons and for the right outcome. And the right outcome is always to glorify Jesus Christ. All right? So here's the other thing, is that sometimes... We find ourselves in situations and we're not surrounded by the best stuff. We don't have the greatest soil. Um, We don't have the the opportunities they may have in bigger cities or, you know, where the population base is bigger or where there's more money in different communities and all that stuff. And it says, where are you called while a slave? And he's going to go to the worst kind of conditions that he can bring out here. All right. So this is what he's asking. Okay. If you were called, and you were called with a, as a slave, and now I'll just say this, this is in no means uh, advocating slavery in the Bible. Okay? Just not, it's just not happening there. He is using a very, you know, the worst kind of human relationship, and then he's using that to make a point on how we're supposed to serve. And it says, were you called while you were a slave? All right. Do not be concerned about that. 
But if you can be made free, rather use it. So here is what is happening is that when God calls you, he recognizes all the, all the circumstances that you're in. He recognizes where your life is. And he still calls you. And that is a statement on who God is, all right? Because a lot of us, when we met Jesus Christ as our Savior and we accepted him and we were filled with the Holy Spirit and we received atonement and forgiveness, we were in the worst state ever in our lives. We were at circling the drain. We are at the bottom of the barrel, okay? It's a lot of times... So many people have to be broken before they are saved. And sometimes, it, what's the song say? I, have to, I had to be knocked down before I could look up. And there is the statement is that God loves us. He has always loved us. He loves us in the perfect way. He has never loved us more or less. He is not affected by what we do. We love him because he first loved us. And he loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And Jesus Christ accepted that because that is the demonstration of God's love towards us that he go to the cross and die even in the form of crucifixion to defeat the curse, the curse of death, okay? It's the curse of sin. So when God calls you, he is aware of all the circumstances, and he, what he is saying is, I'm calling you, I'm aware of all the circumstances going on, and I'm still calling you. Just like when I saved you, I was aware of all the circumstances going on, and I still sent my son to die for you. No one deserved it. You might have been at the worst point of your life, but Jesus Christ still died for you then. Okay, so it shows the unconditional love and the unconditional support of God. And, he, what, and then he goes on to say, but if you can be made free, use it. So what he is saying here is that when you accept this, you know, when you progress and when you start to move through some things and when you better yourself in your situation and your circumstances, he's still going to be there. But guess what? He's still going to rely on you to answer the calling in your life. Because let's just face it. There are two extremes of service. Sometimes there are people who are in such a state that they cannot serve because they can't help themselves. And then there are those who have kind of passed through and they've gotten to a point of success to where it's like, well, you know, I'll just write a check. Now, listen, I need, I, we need your checks, all right? We don't need you to write less checks. But what we do need is that no one can exempt themselves from service. So if you are a regenerated Christian, you're being called to service. And God is aware of where you are. And you know what he's telling you? Bloom where you're planted. Be the best you can. It says, but if you can be made free, use it. He will help you progress. He will be there through the stages, but he's still going to ask you to serve. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. And there is where a lot of us end up in this trap, is that a lot of us think that we are free, but we're actually a slave to a lot of things in our lives. And that's a, that is a conversation and an audit that every one of us needs to take all the time. You need to ask yourself, am I truly free in this world? Okay, I have accepted the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but am I truly free? Or have I tied myself down to some things on this earth? Have I made myself a slave to a job, a slave to someone's opinion of myself, a slave to, to this? Am I doing this that's pulling me out of things I should be doing? Have we created you know, chains that were uh, man-made chains that we're wrapping ourselves up in? Or are we truly free? And if you're truly free then you're a slave to Jesus Christ, which means you're doing everything that Jesus Christ is leading you to do. And that is the perfect place to be, and that is the place to serve, all right? And then here's the other thing, and I'll end with this. Real quick, go back to 20. I want to bring out the, it says, let him, um, but let each one remain let each one remain, that last sentence there, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. There is the second promise of contentment. So after he goes through all this, he's still promising you contentment. 
All right, and then when we get to the end, this is what he says. Brethren, let each one remain with God in a state in which he was called. And there is the promise of contentment. He ends with the promise of contentment. It's found in there three times. So have this conversation with yourself this morning. And this isn't what, you know, a lot of times when we think I need to get happier, the first thing we, need, the first thing we start to do in our heads is like, what can I cut back on? What can I get more free time with, all right? And then what he's saying here, what God is telling us, is that if you want true contentment, then accept the calling I'm placing in your life and go out and exercise that calling in the way that I'm asking you to do it, and then you will receive true contentment because you will find yourself in God's perfect will, which is God's plan for each and every one of us. That's straight Bible, okay? And so what he's saying is, when I call you, I need you to be consistent. I need you to be devout. I need you to be fervent in what I'm calling you to do. And I need you to do it. No excuses. Don't tell me why you can't do it. Go out and do it. And God will show you new ways that it can be done. And then in the end of it, we will receive a a contentment that you can't get any other way. Happiness is not a destination. Let me say that. Happiness is not a place you can drive to. Happiness is, you know, even the beach. You end up sunburnt and you got sand and all your... You ever, those hotels and condos by the beach, sands and everything, isn't it? You just walk and it's just like, all you hear is sand, all right? So even the, even the beach has negatives. But happiness is not a destination. You can't get yourself there. You can't drive yourself there. You can't buy yourself there. Rich people get divorced. Rich people suffer depression, all right? Successful people go through, you know, that we call successful. They go through depression. They sometimes are the most unhappy people in the room. I'm telling you that there is a place of contentment for you. But, like the Bible has been saying all over again, over and over and over and over, It's accepting God's calling and then performing it the way Jesus Christ would have you perform. And that is that you would reflect the way that Jesus Christ would serve. And what did Jesus Christ do? He loved people. He gave people attention that hadn't had attention. He touched lepers. He loved people. He showed them love. He showed them service. And they were attracted to him by the masses And people couldn't understand why he was attracting so much crowd. But it was love that they had never seen before. It was a service they had never seen. And here's what is being preached here. Accept your calling. Accept it now. Quit pushing it off. Quit giving excuses. Quit looking at all the reasons why we can't do what we should be doing. And let's claim it. Let's accept it. And then let's go out and do it. And I promise you. I promise you, because the Bible says so, you will find contentment. This church will find a spirit of contentment. That, And I'm not saying that we don't have it, all right? But what I'm saying is that we will find a spirit in the church, in your family, and in your personal life that you can only get by accepting the service and ministry that God's placing into your life. And do it, and run the good race, and finish strong, Okay? And I love these photos. You ever been driving by a, a bean field and there's a giant corn stalk? Yeah, all right. And just look, look how proud that corn stalk is. Like, I'm corn. <laughs> what are you beans going to do? I'm corn. All right. And then Ariane will spend hours watering these plants and stuff. And, and you know, and, and then she does a good job. And our yard work is beautiful, especially when Jake gets done weeding it in his angst, okay, and then, but, you know, she spends all that time, and then over, like, in the crack of the driveway, there'll be, like, this beautiful flower pop up, it's like, what, what happened, where did that come from, okay, and and look how, look how proud that flower is, it's like, I'm a flower right here in the city, in the crack of a sidewalk, and that's what we're, bloom where you're planted, quit giving us the excuses, You know, I don't have the money. I don't have the influence. I don't have this. If we truly believe what the Bible says, God will provide. 
if we truly believe what the Bible says, his grace is sufficient. Amen? Am I beating you up too hard this morning? This is a great church. Let me finish positive. This is a great church, and it's a friendly church. It's a loving church. It's my job to, continue, to continually push us to serve more, to love more, and to reflect Jesus Christ. All right? I will say this to you. I am the first servant, not in top to bottom, but I'm the first one who should be out there serving. Okay? The level I'm called to serve. Whatever that means, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay? So I'm not exempt from any of this stuff either. Thank you for tuning in to Star Church's sermon. We truly hope that the sermon edified you today and brought you closer to the Lord. For more information about Star Church, visit our website at StarGBChurch.com. Once again, that's StarGBChurch.com. If you would like to visit our church, our address is 4925 State Road, 142 North El Dorado, Illinois, 62930. We now pray that God will bless you as you enter the mission field and bring his word to the world. And as always, we will see you next time here at Star Church. Thank you.